So um, back to it, I want to try to go through some of these constructions that were missing and sort of head towards how the Martin Loft identity type to do actually close off some of the questions that people had about how to build sort of adequate models of a set theory that is constructive. That was his original goal was to make a constructive form of set theory. Um, I did want to remind myself to say this, um, the synthetic homotopy comment I just made, why you need something beyond what we have and why, why we may choose to do this next semester. Uh, it's easy to draw this picture, right? But that seems to require the ambient space of the real plane. And I put the dots in there. Maybe you then have to sort of do all these kind of deformations, but a squiggly line versus a square line don't make a difference. There's a lot of technology to articulate this concept of a dot connected with an edge. So synthetic homotopy is the idea of being able to do the calculations of homotopy groups and homologies and other types of questions like that. Things that you do in a lot of these courses using what you know is going to come at the end of that story. That the variations of the real numbers don't really matter. That you're just going to move this to the skeleton and it's going to become a complex and it's going to be very combinatorial at the end of that. So what do you need to define such a thing? Well, at some level it's an inductive structure. You need to have a point on this structure. And then the thing is, you need to then define how the point is related to itself, right? Everything has to have an equal sign. So the point can be reflexively related to itself. So as an S1 object, so I'm just writing down the Martin Lop identity type, the point is itself, okay? Not surprising. But the key idea is you want to try to interpret what's happening geometrically without putting in some ambient space of a whole bunch of other points, because then you're back to the reals and reproducing this on the graph. So what we want to do is attach a handle to the point without putting the points on the handle. And the synthetic homotopist, is that a phrase? Homotopic theorists? Um, have a solution for that. They create a higher order type. And this is what they invented in that somewhat now famous um, global Wolfwalk meeting. And the people are still alive, some of them, both myself and I know. Uh, so this extra loop condition is adding a new path to the inductive process of proving equality, which says that you could have gotten to your point by starting where you were, reflexively, or you could have gone on some journey called the loop and back. The loop has no points on it. The loop is not a set of points in R2. It is just purely a formal object added as a new path in the equality type. So now any function that's based on the circle, you know, homotopies are functions from the circle into your set X. These have to be defined so that they satisfy the Leibniz rule, meaning that if you have X is equivalent to Y, then F of X needs to be equivalent to F of Y, which we now see is to check two different conditions. Does the point go to a point? does the, lot, the loop go to the loop, okay? And there's no intermediate points on that loop, it's just now a relationship of how you move those points around. And those are not the same. Those are not contractible one to another. They're two different input types, two different constructors of your data type. If you follow down the logic of this, it doesn't mean anything too deep for only one example. For something like this, you could program some alternative gadget like this. And you basically have to say, well, now I have two ways to get introduced into my data structure, right? I have this thing called S1, and I could either put a point on it or I could put it on loop. And then if I go through, my equalities have to pass those two paths, and I have to make computation rules for both. How are you going to make that work consistently for all possible types? That becomes the harder question. And it becomes an issue because as you start doing this, you could start to have higher order things. Like you could start to ask, well, maybe I want sort of surfaces that are trying to be between two loops. So now I'm going to move up to an S2 object. And so now I have sort of the hemisphere, so sort of the, what do you call that? The equator of a sphere. And then these, this thing put on it, this shell put on it. And I want those all to collapse and be one synthetic object. And so these get higher and higher, and you can make as many things as you want. The remarkable thing is that if you write down these kinds of calculations and do it with this type, you actually recover all the cool stuff that you expect. So there's kind of a not obvious map 
from S3, which I cannot draw, onto S2. Okay? And this gives you an element in the higher, the hop vibration, yeah. So this gives you a higher element in the homotopy group of the sphere. And that feels like you need to use real numbers when you first sort of explore it, very geometric construction. It turns out you can just do it completely on the synthetic level. And various other things have been shown to be completely synthetic. So they really are about the geometry of the topology and not about embedding things into real numbers, which I think every topologist sort of knows. They want to erase the reals and just make it about the subsets and the inclusions and all the things that are necessary. But anyway, this is not something you do with Martin Law of Identity Types, because they stop right here, by definition. And therefore, they make very nice computation rules. But this starts to mess with your brain, because you realize you have multiple paths, and you got to make them all consistent. What does that even mean? So there are a lot of guesses how to do that. Some of the guesses were, let's do it inductively, like just truncate somewhere, and as long as you can mess with it up to some level. But to get to the word for infinity, that becomes the hard question. Okay. So hopefully that answered the question as to what might appear next semester. But we can also appear with other things. So we'll start next semester the way we always do, with a discussion of what we'd enjoy seeing. OK? All right, so I'm going to try to do a demo, but I, I um, on my laptop, I was not able to install Idris successfully. It's a kind of a cantankerous language. And so then I, I knew it was running on my desktop, so I tried to like SSH in and film from there. And I told you about my woes. I cannot get it to connect. I'll try one more time. If it doesn't connect, then I'll show you a static non-demonstration. And hopefully someday, I sit down and record an actual demonstration you can watch. But this is one piece of this storyline that we haven't really explored, which I think is kind of key. And then we'll move into the division algorithm. We'll see what this really means. So we know how to take partition products of things. So now I want to talk about things like subsets and equivalence relations and things of this order. OK? These are the things that we often use in our arithmetic, our set theory. but we're moving into types where things have slightly different flavor. And what I'm going to try to emphasize today is that these look natural if you view them through the lens of a category, and silly if you look with them as sets. OK, that's the key thing that we'll see. And that's, that's why these are closer to category theory than set theory these days. OK? So subsets, let's just take the natural numbers. There's no reason to get creative today. Okay, so zero and its successor. That's our type. We've, this is just shorthand for an inductive type, where it's two introduction rules, and the in, in, induction is the is the elimination, and recursion is the computation. Right? We've got that. Now, a natural subset of the natural numbers would be, say, the positive natural numbers. And we're going to need that in our division algorithm. If we're going to pull that off, we're going to be able to say, well, don't divide by zero. So we're going to have to say somehow exclude this. Now, mathematicians have lots of shortcuts for writing such things. They can say, for example, I want the natural numbers, which are not equal to 0. But not equal is not a great type theory object, because not equal is something you have to give evidence for. In a constructive language, like type theory, constructive type theory, you can't just say it's not true. That just means you have no evidence for it. So to say it's not, you need to somehow give evidence for it not being 0. And this requires you to think a little bit more carefully about what you mean. Now, in the natural numbers, there's lots of other ways to think about not here. Instead of thinking of not equaling 0, what are some things we could say that are positive? Like things we could say about it rather than things that we can't say about it. You could say start with 1 and then find the successor from there. Yeah. Somehow I thought this was going to work, but there we go. So I could say, I want n to be a successor of somebody. Okay, So now there'd be an existence question here. Does there exist a k, that's the natural number, such that n is the successor of k? That'd be a concrete, provable claim as to it not being 0. Okay, And so if we do that, we can start to think about how to create a new type for this. right? So what's our introduction rule going to be if we're going to try to pull this off? from Amari's suggestion just now.
So you need to introduce something in this set, and you're going to create a type called pause and act, right? So we're going to say that our information is going to give us a positive natural number, or if you like, you can still use this notation, but I'm just trying to write it the way you might type it in a computer program. And then you need an introduction. That's a formation rule. It doesn't depend on anything. But the introduction rule now, as Amari has just said, is no longer starting from nothing. You must start from some natural number, right? And if you have a natural number, then the successor of that natural number gets to be an example. But you have to be careful. Successor of k, if I was to write this, now I have a problem. Am I defining, but let's go ahead and keep this notation, I realize. I'm too lazy to write pause and add everywhere. Okay. But when you come to programming it, typing it might be easier though. What's the difficulty with having written this? So I'm trying to show you that the, the set theory doesn't transfer to the types. But don't worry, we're going to come back with a category approach and it'll look nice again. But right now it's not looking nice. The point is, it seems like all we want to do is say, like, the successor that backs up evidence that it's not zero, so therefore it's of this type. What's the problem with that? Or is there a problem? Go ahead. We have a reduce. We have what, sorry? Reduce for a successor of k. Oh, that's a good question. Is there a reduced form of this? I think successor of anything is already reduced. Remember that, that Dustin was telling us that once you take this sort of whatever's inside, if you put the outside of the right kind, you're done. So that's already reduced. But it's reduced of what type? The naturals. The naturals, right? So this is a thing of type this. And now you're trying to create, and remember this is just notation. Whatever this is is saying the name for the introduction rule, the name of the constructor. has no meaning. There is no successor of k. That's just the constructor for one type of natural number. So you can't have it be both things. So whatever you do here, it's maybe call it next k or something. It's not the successor of k at all. That's a different type of data. You have to create your own copy of your own data. Now we've created a mess because now n0 is not a subset of n. They're not even the same kind of data. And so did we create a subset? Which was our goal, right? We, we first had to get rid of this kind of negative attitude and become positive. That was great. You were all, Amari was positive. Some of you were negative, but Amari was helpful here. But that didn't solve all the problems because it just kicked the can down the road. So now we have like two completely parallel universes, one that calls them positives and one that calls them possibly zero. How do you fix this? Make a map. You could make a map at least. Can we make a map from here to there? Which takes, let's see, what, what are the things that we can introduce in this case? They're always of the form next k, right? And what should they kick out? SK. Just SK. Okay. And that will actually take whatever this thing is as a goofy new type, a new set, if you will, and put it inside that set. And what will it avoid in the image? It'll always avoid zero. It'll always avoid zero. So in some sense, if you view it not as purely the type pause nat, look, if you just look at this, there's, this is indistinguishable from this, right? It's just counting things starting at one. And you'd have no reason to think that that's not just the copy of, of the natural numbers. If you just think you're going to counting, it's like the first one would be one, then two, and you could have just called that zero. It's up to your labeling. This is indistinguishable from that until you put on this extra information of this morphism. Now, where do you see this in your other lives? Where is the world you have to live in where you don't get to just talk about objects, you also have to talk about how they relate to other objects? Category That's the category theory thing, right? So there are no subsets in category theory, right? What do you have to do if you have a sub something in a category? You have to provide a morphism that maps in with some properties about it being like injective, some, some qualified version of that, right? So there's a natural way to think about these types as being subtypes, provided they satisfy the categorical description of being a sub-object. And that's going to do well enough for subbing things. 
in type theory. And that's kind of a hint that a lot of the things have to translate in that way. And it's probably because category theory came along later in life, and so it had to sort of deal with things in a more universal way than set theory had to. Let's see if we can now write that down. I'm going to refine this in a minute, but for today, for right now, I'm going to say, suppose I have a function from a data type A to the family called type. So every little P of A is a type. I will refine this in a second, so leave yourself some room for me to write a refined version of this if you're writing it down. Now, in set theory language, we're routinely writing sentences like this. Some property is true about A. If it's true, it gets to be in this set, and this is defining a subset. And in fact, there's an axiom in set theory that says all subsets take this form. Axiom of specification. If you have a subset of things, there's some property P running around that explains what it means to be a member of this set. It's just an assumption that's made about how to build some kind of set. Okay? But we're taking the view that everything has a type to it. So this is not just true or false, this is evidence for it. That's why we took the view of P of A being a type. But now, this isn't a thing. This is not a way to construct a type. Just putting curly braces by it doesn't do anything. You might use that notation. But what do you mean by producing the type? Well, we already saw you had to take that and do some new type based on P. So it's pretty easy to think what the introduction is. Your formation rule is going to say, well, I have to have this property from A to type. And if I have such a thing, then I get to describe what I'll call the subtype. This is just notation, remember. So that's going to be a brand new type living in its own home. Okay, and then I need to introduce that thing. Okay, so I introduce it by, so I wanna put something in this type, right? This is the name of a type. We could call it capital B if you wanted to. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to introduce an example, an inhabitant of this type. And the notation is meant to help you know what to put on the numerator in the antecedents, right? So we're going to create an example of this from some data up here. So, sorry, say it louder. What are you? Um, just Tim. A and A. a so there's an A colon capital A. That's replacing what that means, right? We have to have an actual element of type A. Okay, what else? Anything else? Remember with the, with the positive natural numbers, what did we have specifically as our evidence? We had a K that would be the evidence of the successor. So we had some evidence that came in that sort of proved it was bigger than zero. Here, I don't know what P is. It's not successor language anymore, but P of A is a type. And if you have evidence, then it should be of that type. So there's proof or evidence of type P of A. You have to give me the element together with its evidence. Then I will have an, a member that depends on these two pieces of data. That's again just the name of my introduction law for this particular data type that I'm creating right here. All right, so I'm creating this type. Is this a subset of the original A? No, I mean, A is not even a set, it's a type, right? So even to think of the word subset already tells you there's a hint that something going wrong, it's hinky somehow. But what do you expect to do? You should be able to have some morphism. You should be able to get a morphism out of A. So we're going to need, or sorry, out of this set. Again, this is just notation. It's just like putting B sub P on it or something like that. But it's a little bit more suggestive notation. But I'm going to want a function that gets me to A. And it should behave like an inclusion, so I'll use the hook notation, even though that would be stuff we have to add to this function, declaring that it is injective, or whatever appropriate meaning that is, the categorical picture of that. And then what should happen here is, well, only things that come in are members, 
of A and the proof, right? That's, that's the only way I introduced things so far. So what's the obvious way to get an element of A out of this? Pluck out A. Pluck out A. Okay. Now in truth, we haven't settled this. We still have elimination and computation rules to do here. And then we're going to be off to doing things about that. But in truth, you can start to see that, well, actually, I don't actually need to invent something new. Because look at how I'm using it. I'm sort of just taking A and the proof that it belongs in the subset and gluing it together. And when I need the A, I kick out the A. And the proof was there to make sure I don't put things in that don't belong. It's like a guard. If you're a programmer, you have guards. That's a guard. But that's kind of the only rule here. And in fact, what's really going on is that we have something that's quantified over A and a proof that depends over A. So that's a dependent type. What's happening here is that we have some A of type A and then something in that type. That's what one of these members really is. Now we could create our own type, but every time we create our own type, we have to then go through and match up with functions all the other types that look the same. So in some ways, a shortcut is don't create your own type, but use an existing type building thing to create a member of this. Okay, now I don't like the sum notation because I'm an algebraist. It means too many different things to me. And I think this next notation is much more suggestive to you. If I take a property A that maps two sets, and I took the disjoint union of these sets, what could I see this being? Now, when I say it like that, you should see what I'm going to have to modify. I said I would have to modify something here. But if I just did a disjoint union of sets, why would that ever be the same thing as the things in A that satisfy P of A? What qualities would you need out of P of A for that to be the same? So suppose that P of A kicked out a set of size 19 for every element A. Start disjoint unioning. How big is the set I'm building up here? It's 19 times the size of A. And that's hardly ever a subset of A, at least for any finite set, right? So somehow that's kind of already a counting argument tells you that it can't be equal. And yet it's trying to masquerade as that. Like what we're doing is exactly this kind of data type. But it's not, it's trying to be this. How is it ever going to be that on the nose? Well, what do we not want in this set? This subset. Well, things that don't have the property or not. Things that don't have the property P of A, whatever P of A is. So let's say that if they don't have the property, there's no evidence for them, right? We would have introduced them, which means that those are empty sets. Okay, so part one is if you're not in the subset, you're empty. But what if you are in the subset and this P of A has 19 witnesses to you? Then you still have this overcounting problem, way too many evidences for the same thing. So it's not the disjoint union. What do you need to have about the proof of being property A? How big can that set be? Anybody? It's the, the whole, uh, for each individual little a, how big can p of a be? For each little a that's in here, if it's not in here, empty set, we just agreed. So if, if little a is not in this subset, in the set theory language that you're, you're trying to mimic here, that is going to imply that p of a is empty. It's the uninhabited type. Okay, it's nothing in it. If A is in there, and you don't want the cardinalities to deviate, you want this to feel like a copy of the subset, it has to be at most one. It has to be yeah. exactly one when it's in there. Yeah. Yeah, and most one in general. Most one in general, right. Because that way you get the matchup of exactly one copy. So this is a strange little uh, rule in saying that if you want to make subsets out of this, you don't just take it into types. You take it into types that have a specific bounded size. Size at most one. And I'm going to use the name prop for this. 
because prop is the set of types called mere propositions. And they are simply the types with at most one inhabitant. Ones that don't have any inhabitants, we sort of think of as false propositions, right? Proposition, this is a this is a dangerous place. Mathematicians use proposition as I know this is true, I'm gonna provide you a proof, or I'm gonna make you do it as homework. That's like the way you think of a proposition. It's definitely true once somebody wrote the word in bold proposition. When you go to the type theory, similar to using sums in different ways and products in different ways, the word proposition no longer means it's true. It means it's a claim. You're proposing it to be true. And it either has a proof or it doesn't. And not having a proof isn't proof that it's false. It just means you don't know it's true. So you have this netherworld of intuitionistic logic where it could be true if you had a proof, could be false if you could prove no proof could be made, but it might just be unknowable or unknown. You don't know. Okay. The set of mere propositions gets abbreviated to prop, and it's the name for all the types that have exactly one inhabitant in it. Any examples of that you already have seen? How about something like this type here? Maybe I'm going to erase the board. How about something like one is naturally equivalent to one? Right, the natural number type. This is a type. This is a Martin Loff identity type, right? We also wrote it as ID nat one one. Okay. Now that's a type. How big is the set of evidence? What can we introduce to that type? We only allow to introduce it by the reflexive law. If we can introduce anything, so the, it's by the reflexive law. The A is the, um, the case where there's nothing in it corresponds to falsity, and the case where there's exactly one thing in the type corresponds to the, like it's true. Close if you think of the world having a law of excluded middle. Then you just say, when I don't have an introduction, then it definitely is false. Yeah, but in these models, we don't jump the gun. We just say, I don't know if you can introduce something or not. So we leave it open to discussion. But otherwise, yes, you're absolutely right. If there's one introduction rule and it doesn't depend on, on parameters that would vary, like notice it's more than just having one introduction rule. You could have one introduction rule and then it depends on a parameter that keeps changing and you make tons of evidence of that one type. But this is one introduction rule for the entire description of the type. That one introduction rule depends on parts of that type, in fact. The reflexive one has that type. But then if you go to 1 equals 2, now here we could actually prove that it cannot be inhabited, that there's no path to get to 1 equals 2 because they're not equal. We can actually make a proof of that by showing that if it were true, you could lead to making the empty set um, as a conclusion. Okay? So then everything gets true. So, so we can show this one doesn't have an introduction, and therefore we're in trouble. Sorry, therefore it's also a mere proposition. So these are all in the world of mere propositions. So it's a weird class, but in homotopy type theory, you see this place everywhere, These, this prop, this special type of types. And it feels at first like, come on, who wants a type with only one thing in it? What could you ever prove with only one thing in it, right? I mean, the point is that you want to be able to take the disjoint unions of things with one thing in it and that it represent a subset. Now, this mapping of projected to A will cover the same concept of being a subset, but in a categorically friendly way. You don't actually have it being a sub-anything. Nobody's a subset of anything. They all live in their own homes. They're all their own pieces of data, and there's just functions between them. Okay? And then equality gets subtle, because maybe you have one program that goes through one path of how to embed, and other programs through another path, so now you have equality between functions. Are these the same sub-object? Well, they're naturally the same. They go through some third triangle thing, right? That's how you define sub-objects in type theory. Oh, I'm sorry. What do you call this thing? Category theory? I've been doing types so long. So if I have B mapping into A and C mapping into A, then I want to have a unique map here, right? 
Did I get that right? What am I? Let's try to think about the sub object thing. Like, there's some rule here. I have to think about how it works. So, the sub objects are like equivalent classes of monomorphisms. Okay, so I have to define monomorphism first, and then I get equivalence classes of monomorphism. But that same thing is going to happen here. You're not going to have necessarily one way to think of this sub thing because it could be equivalent to some other representation. And that's totally natural. So we do want the monic property from the categorical context, but that does work. Well, that's why we moved all the way to prop. That guarantees it. Okay. So if we hadn't, then we would have these larger objects that are somehow pushed into A with large fibers. Okay. And you can see now why it's a problem to add different paths to equality. These are mere propositions. Therefore, saying I want the things that are equal to something or other being a subset, the set of solutions to this equation is a b -b 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 equation, right? If that's a mere proposition, then that's a subset of your affine space. You make some big geometry, you've got a curve in there now. If you have different paths, non homotopic paths, now that solution space doesn't make sense as a subspace of the bigger affine space. So all of a sudden, what we mean by subset is disturbed, and that causes problems. So now you've got to fix that equality issue. If you make more equalities, you still want them to behave like mere propositions sometimes, and they won't necessarily by any naive approach. Okay? And so there's a whole theory of like H levels of things that are sort of built this way or that. So here's a definition. Wait, if I think of some mere Right, mere propositions are propositions in which any two proofs are equivalent, meaning that once you asked what does it mean for two proofs to be equal, they would come out the same. But you have to explain what you mean for two proofs to be equal, and that gets into some subtleties. So there's a, there's a theory by Jensen that says that for arithmetic proofs, the only differences you can make between two proofs is the lemmas you decide to have. So you might go to some step and say, now by lemma 14, I go to the next step. But what does that really mean? That means that you're like the librarian, you oh, I have to go look back over here, and pull off the shelf, lemma 14, and I go and I paste it into my program, right? And then I read to the next lemma. If I take any proof in the world about arithmetic, and remove all the lemmas and cut and paste what it says to do there and cancel anything that's kind of a tautology, right? Like starts with A, blah, 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 and then ends with A. Just cut that out, just call it A. Okay? So shrink all the tautologies. Then Jensen's theorem says the arithmetic proofs are unique. They are mere propositions. But that's not everything, right? Arithmetic is a very small subset of mathematics, a huge subset of mathematics, but it's not all mathematics. And so some things require different types of proofs, and those could be indirect. And therefore, we need a higher homotopy theory in order to manage that type of process, right? So it's, it's hopefully you're seeing like what this solved and what it didn't solve, right? It solved like the easy stuff, the stuff that arithmetic can do, and then it kind of peters out when you go outside of arithmetic, baby number theory. I mean, like really elementary number theory, the kind that you learn as an undergrad division algorithm kind of stuff. This does it. But that's not the stuff we're really worried about. We're worried about flying planes autonomously or driving cars autonomously. These are much higher order sophisticated logic than simply does division come out correctly every time. So we've learned how to teach computers to divide correctly. That's not a question we actually had. We could just proofread the code. We can almost read the circuitry correctly. But higher order reasoning, things that are dealing on high sophisticated systems that are being abstracted over very different kinds of logic, they don't have that robust theory of concrete, provable, machine checkable stuff. And that's what we're trying to build out in the current generation of researchers. And that's why it's a university topic, not something you just pick up your favorite programming language and sit there. One definition of a set, finally, for 
first time in your life, perhaps, you finally see a definition of set, which is consistent and checked out with models and all this stuff. Not, not that DFC doesn't show up somewhere on some sheet of paper in your life, but how many of you remember any of those axioms, right, or could use them? So at some point now, you've developed enough sophistication to know that types are just a list of rules, how to form it notationally, what allows you to introduce it, how do you get to use it, and what's the rule that relates those two. If you bubble that together, you get a lot of special types that build a lot of important initial things. So for example, you need to be able to build things like induction, you need pi types, sum types, all the logic gets recovered from those things. So now you're building things that look like sets, but they're not behaving like sets until they have properties like what you just said, subsets and things like this. But that will only work at the end of the day if the things you want to compare are also comparable by mere propositions. If even in the set A and A, A and A tilde can be equal by two different paths, like the S1 example, then no matter how mere propositionally you good, get on that, you still have a path between those outside in your other set. So the only place you could form subsets is if your ambient thing was already a set, meaning that its equality was always a mere proposition. So the definition of set theory is this. Sets whose equivalence, whose equal sign means, it's a mere proposition. Okay. What are the types you mean? Not sets. Types. Types whose equality is a mere proposition. Now Martin Loeb introduced a type theory in which all types are sets. just define the only equality to be a mere proposition. But we think there are types that benefit from not having only mere propositional equality. They, we don't know how we to relate them unless we add higher order relations. And so therefore, we've been exploring things that don't fit this type of set theory. And so homotopy type theory comes along and chooses a better color. And homotopy type theory sits over here. And it says sets can have equalities that have more than mere propositions. Get used to it. Although it doesn't say sets, it says types can have equalities that aren't mere propositions, and there are types that aren't sets. And so there's strictly larger class of stuff you can study in this type of type theory, including things like small categories, but also locally small categories and things like that. So the cat cat, right, the category of categories that are that are all small, the category of categories that are locally small, that kind of hierarchy, you can talk about it here. And now the notion of functor starts to make sense. Because functor is like this vague idea of it's a function between two things. And a function is a what? Like what what is the domain and codomain? They're not sets. So you run into trouble even expressing what you mean mathematically, let alone teaching a computer to do this. And then you want to use that to make some kind of fundamental systems. You need this higher type theory. Okay. Okay, with that said, let me now attempt to show you the division algorithm in a Martin Loft everything's a set type theory, okay? I'm excited.